Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us here on this particular episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series, where today we'll take a look at leadership and what drives us for certainty in an ever-increasingly uncertain times. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers to hire, executive mentor, entrepreneur magazine contributor, and international business speaker. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, I want to thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go Full Monty. If you're a regular, big thank you to you for making us the number one show for Fortune 500 listeners and viewers, and for keeping us right at the top in next-gen leadership, human resources, and a whole bunch of other great categories. So thank you for sharing the show with everybody that you know. And remember, as always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Watching and listening this show today, you're either a high-level executive, an entrepreneur, a leader in some capacity. And as a leader, in whatever form it is, we must be able to evaluate risk against certainty. If you're doing well, there's a tendency to want to cling on to the certainty of what's worked. The challenge is that nothing remains the same. Furthermore, if you keep clinging to what, it, what was certain, pretty soon it's going to get pulled away from you. So what do you do when everything gets pulled away from you? Well, my guest today is Amy Slater. She is the founder and CEO of Amy Slater Consulting. She's had more than 25 years of leadership and global sales experience. She was the vice president at media, entertainment, telecom, uh, technologies, Axiom Corporation. She's vice president, uh, uh, enterprise corporation, sales, salesforce.com, Cisco, cable, wireless, AT&T, Quest. I mean, you know, girls on everything, right? Whatever. Anyway. Today, came, Amy is a sought-after speaker who delivers messages on building a professional brand and leading through cultivating of, cultivation of culture. Amy was a keynote speaker at the 2014 Forrester Research Conference in San Francisco and a, pa and a panelist at Domo Women Business Tour. She is a best-selling author of Moments, Magic, Miracles, and Martinis, baby. How to move forward in times of uncertainty. So, please put your hands together and welcome Amy Slater. <laughs> Crowd goes wild. Welcome. They're on their feet. They are. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, tell us why uh, mo magic, miracles, and martinis. Why moments? Why, why did you Why did you title your book that? And why? Sort of give us a quick sort of pull into how that came about as a title. It's a bizarre title. I, I know, exactly. So people pay attention. I've actually had that conversation more than once this I week bet. about yeah. moments and, and why I speak of moments. And I have to say, I, it was the first thing that came to mind, so I'll, I'll give it credit for that. And it's really about those moments in time that we find we make the most change or we find magic, magic in the moment that actually a moment can change your life if you turn right instead of left. Mm -hmm. um, I've been fascinated by the movie Sliding Doors, if you've ever seen that, with Gwyneth Paltrow, right? She yep. gets on the train, she doesn't get on the train, and you watch the trajectory of her life going either direction. And that's the same in, in, in our own lives. It's not just about a movie. That no. you think about decisions that you make in that moment and what happens to your life. And then it also, in, a, in another way, it's looking at each moment and living each moment. And in my book, I talk about my father's terminal illness, and I think about what it's going to be like aging, that I want to live every single moment in the best way I can, even when things turn, as you talk about, uncertain. Right. How, do you, how can you make it more certain in your life so that you appreciate every moment? And that's really uh, where the title came from. You know, it, it, it's interesting because I was saying this to, to a guest and a friend of mine recently. I was saying that, you know, I can remember when people used to say, um, he, she died peacefully, mm. you know, uh, um, and I remember thinking, is that really how I want to go? 
yeah. <laughs> like, you know, this, it's screaming, maybe, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's a quote, and I can't remember who it was by, but it says, you know, I want to I want to slide into my grave, like, just like, yeah. in a screeching yeah. halt, because I want to be vibrantly alive. And I think that the, the times that we live in have really brought us to, it very much is either or, that you're, you're either going to go in there full barrel and, and give it everything you've got, or you're going to slide quietly into your grave. And I think that, you know, there's two massive population groups right now, of course. One is these emerging fabulous millennials who I love and with their value system. And the other massive is, of course, us. They, well, not, not necessarily you, but certainly me, the baby boomers who are older. And we were that massive population. And I, and I really see that in the in the in the baby rumors that I often work with because I work with both of those groups but in the baby rumors that I work with there's this uncertainty because we grew up I mean, again we meaning me and people in my age bracket but we grew up with this idea that and it was a fant fabulous fantastic fantasy that we were going to reach 60 years old somebody was going and to retire give us, fat, dumb, and going to give us a handshake and a, and a nice retirement and we were going to move to florida or somewhere and play golf right a and because of the changing world and the changing economy and all those kinds of things so many of us have gone on become entrepreneurial somebody in our age bracket have become entrepreneurial and, and we realized yeah you know what and, and there's a new book about this talking about how 60 is the new it's the new workforce. It's it's a new entrepreneurial age. People who are moving away from the corporate job and going, okay, now it's time for me, and but not to retire, but actually to do something else. You have talked here about this this importance of embracing the moment, but that moment, very often in my experience and the people I've worked with, is a moment that shakes everything up. It's not a moment. I mean, we like to think of it as a moment where the clouds burst open. Right. And you get the light bulb. Oh, because, aha, I yeah, didn't or, do this. Or right. the clouds open and, you know, yeah. and suddenly everything's yeah. great. No, it's, it's more an oh shit moment. Sorry. It's an oh shit moment, really. It, there's no need to apologize. That's exactly what it is. It's something yeah. where, oh shit, now what? Yeah. You had, so tell us about it. You had your dad diagnosed. There was a whole. Series yeah, of those so I got I got divorced. That's more than one moment of oh shit, right? I got was going through divorce. I have a chronic intestinal problem that I've had since I was a child, but it gets worse in times of stress. stress. And, yeah. and then my father was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia uh, and Parkinson's all at the same time. And yeah. you gotta say, okay, crap. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna live my life? You know, I live, I always live a pretty positive life anyways, but how do you do that when you feel like the world is crashing down on you? And so I, I didn't want to stay in that space. I didn't want to be that victim with a cloud and, and I had a high pressure job and I always had to, you know, I was at Cisco and then Salesforce at the time as I was going through my divorce and a lot of these things, but I showed up at work, you know. Like people didn't know anything was going on until I lost about 15 pounds and they're like, Oh my God, I think she's dying. What's wrong? You know, and <laughs> there's like, a sign there's a problem. She looks yeah, like she's dying. I got to turn this thing upside down, you know, so I had to get a hold of things and figure it out. And then I just found inspiration. And once I found inspiration, then I wanted to give it back to the rest, really to the rest of the universe. When I found a way um, that I could handle uncertainty, which is really hard. And so much like you said in the in the beginning, it is uncertain. The only thing, just like the only thing constant is change. The only thing truthful is it will be uncertain. Absolutely. But you said you found inspiration. That yeah. That's kind of vague. Tell us what you mean by that for you. Uh, and, yeah. and particularly for the people, who are, our viewers who are watching this and, you know, Right now, somebody just backed up the truck and dumped 30 tons of shit on them in the yeah. form of a divorce or a you know, diagnosis or whatever it might be, yeah. or my whole, my whole executive team or the board walked out, whatever it might be, and they feel like they're under that 30 tons of shit. How do they find inspiration? What was yours specifically, and, and how can they find theirs? Yeah. Hopefully, they find inspiration from me, um, which most people, when, when they do walk away and we've had a conversation, people are like, wow, I feel better. And... And I think that's what I felt years ago when I sat on the couch and someone had sent me the uh, Brene Brown 
uh, TED.com video on vulnerability. Right. And it shook me. You talk about shaking you up. It shook me up and basically said, stop being so strong and be human. Stop. And stop. Be, and stop, be stop, stop. I want everybody to, to, to get that because uh, I'm sorry. I know that you're preaching to the choir here because I'm, I talk in my book. I talked a lot of last book. I talked a lot about vulnerability is power. Yeah. But, but you just said something. I think that everybody needs to listen. Stop being strong. Tell mm -hmm. us just about that piece because yeah. right there, it's such a country me contradictory message from the crap we've been filled with. You know, yeah. be strong. You know, you're going through a divorce. You've got IBS. Your dad's sick. Be strong would be the most common piece of advice I can imagine you would get. Yeah. yeah. And you're yeah. going, stop being strong. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. So essentially, like I think many of us that are in leadership, executive positions, or just anybody, but in particular, I think those of us who have those qualities, that feeling is, I have to be strong. And I grew up, I was born that way. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that I had to be perfect. And that I was, you know, my mom, you know, in my arms, and she told me every birthday, I looked at you and said, she said, you're my golden child. Well, that was a lot of pressure. No pressure there. Oh. You know, no pressure. I couldn't <laughs> mess up. And so I lived my whole life with this veneer of strength. And inside, obviously, inside my body, I was crumbling. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want anyone to think that I was weak. So vulnerability, I thought, was weakness. What I learned through that initial 20-minute video from Brene Brown is let it go. Let it go. And in fact, one of the chapters in my book is let it go. Another chapter is slow down. Like, it's okay. And then how do you find, you know, support? And how do you find that's magic? You find the magic when you slow down and you allow yourself. You allow. You allow good things in. And you can't. If you have a big wall up, what's gonna, what good can come of that? And I say, you know, you can't see out and no one can see in. And I found that once I let down that wall, my entire life changed from business, my relationships in the business and the workplace changed, even though I thought I was a good leader. Once I became vulnerable, it, it changed my world. As a parent, I came, became a way better parent when I was able to be vulnerable with so my children. So tell us how you applied that in the in the context, specifically in the context of leadership, because as I said, you know, we as leaders have been conditioned with vulnerability as a weakness. Um, I certainly am a proponent and great deep believer in, in that vulnerability as power. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, you, you decided to walk that into the workforce. So tell us about the, 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 the original experience of walking vulnerability into the workforce mm -hmm. uh, from, as you said, from having the veneer of I've got all my poo in a pile. Yeah. Just, right? <laughs> no pun intended, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, I guess, did, yeah. Right? But, you know, I've got my shit together. I've got my poo in a yeah. pile. To, to making this decision that, you know what, I'm going to show up and be vulnerable. Can you walk us through the, your first experience of that and what that was like? Because I can imagine, and again, forgive me, no pun intended, but you must have been shitting yourself. I literally was. Right. You know, I know. It's so it's just, it's great to be able to make fun of it. And that's the first part, seriously, is to be able to talk about it and laugh about it. And so a lot of those first experiences happen when I would sit around a table, literally at a business dinner with all men for the most part. Right. And I have to order my food. And I can't order certain things because I finally learned what was making me sick. Right. So I'd sit there and say, um, I'd like uh, steamed rice and some steamed asparagus and an extra dirty vodka martini. Because, and then they're like, what is wrong with this chick? Well, she's, because, she's so clean eating, but let's wash it down with a martini. But it could be, it was gluten free. The vodka is gluten free. It was potato <laughs> vodka, right? So that's hence the name martinis in my book. Right. But, and so people would look at me like I was a freak. And then I would say, and I would tell them why. Instead of saying, I'm not feeling well, or I have this thing, I would just say it. And do you know how many people would say, oh my gosh, I have that too. Right. And I'd say, let me tell you what I did to heal myself. And then I, and so I really became someone who could inspire others to feel better. And I can't tell you now it's, I talk about it 
you know, not the great details, but you bring it up some, a lot of times at dinner and I'll have someone sit next to me and say, oh my gosh, I have that too. I just took this blood test. I said, well, that's what I did too. And so people want someone who's relatable. And so, so there's at the business table. And then I take it the next step further in terms of vulnerability. And that's being vulnerable enough to show who you are, not just what you do. So in my office, my most recent office, I had uh, a waterfall thing that I would have that just to keep peace. And I had different so things that were personally important to me to create a peaceful sort of this kind of Zen environment. Sure. Who does that in a business office? Mm -hmm. Most people in my office don't even put a photo, but I had basically a shrine of my children and of things that matter to me, things of turtles, because I love turtles, but it's vulnerability is showing up as who you are, not what you do, but who you are and not being afraid. I've cried in meetings with my team, not because I was sad, but because I was touched by what somebody said. Yeah. And no one looked at me and said, oh, she's weak and she's a baby. And why is she doing that? And I wasn't sobbing, but it show, I show emotion, not this tough girl that women in particular. You just hit where I was going to go. You just hit where I was going to go. Because I think that um, in social conditioning, us guys, we've been told we're supposed to be tough. And... and and it's horse shit, um, yeah. and, it, and it's da extremely damaging for men um, because we don't get in touch with our emotions. We don't get in touch with the truth of who we are. We we enter, we end up driving away from empathy and compassion and the things yeah. that were really needed in leadership. But one of the things that concerns me, I'm, I'm a big feminist. I'm a big believer in women's rights, and I fight for them and make all kinds of comments about them, write articles about them. I just wrote one. Uh, for Entrepreneur Magazine that said, have women given up the battle for equality because 42% yeah. of them voted for a candidate who is actually against women's rights. That being a sort of sidebar for a moment, because of that social conditioning that men have to be tough and repress everything, if a woman wants a man's position, quote, sorry, but quote a man's position, yes. right, or something that's seen as a man's position, Basically, she must become a man, right. right? So she has to also now doubly repress emotion, doubly repress her right. empathy and compassion. She basically has to strap on a pair of false balls and pretend yeah. she's a guy, which yeah. is extremely dangerous. It is. Tell me about facing that because I think that in many ways the pressure is even more on a woman when she steps into a role that has been perceived as a male role, for her to be even more macho. You know, I, I, I'll i be honest, I, I'm i fortunate. I don't live in the United States, although I'm politically very American. I've studied politics since, uh, since I was 10 for, uh, about the U.S. Um, but I had to say I'm not a big fan of the candidate who won, but I also was not a fan of the candidate he was against. And the reason for that was because back when – she ran against Obama, I said, she makes me nervous because she's kind of too much of a guy. She's yeah. she's not in touch enough with that yin. Um, yeah. That makes me nervous because there's that overcompensation. And, I, and the reason I say that is because I saw that so often in CEOs, female CEOs. I see that so often in female senior executives uh, in the C-suite who are tr trying to out-guy the guys. Right. And it started it started in the in the beginning of the feminist movement just in the way women dressed. Right. These ties appear and these pantsuit, you know, and this whole thing of being masculine when diversity is about being not what your DNA says exactly, you know, it's about the thought and what goes into it. When you say you want to, you know, to have diversity, it's not just to have a, a, someone who says she's a woman act like a man. You want a woman to act like a woman because you right. want diversity of thought. Yes. And it is a huge challenge. And I have to say over the last few years, probably the last five years, I really had to speak my voice. And, you know, I'd be in meetings where you do those personality profile things that DISC is one of them, right? Yep. D is dominant, I being, you know, influence, and then S and C, the more, you know, kind of science type, the people that are really focusing on numbers and details. So I'm in a room with about a dozen men in, it, in my company, and we were looking at the results. Who's the only I in the room? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I am the only I, and the rest are what? D. D. 
Dumb and they're like, like yeah, yeah douchebag, right? <laughs> and I yes. Kidding. So so they're all D's and they're I'm the I. Right. And and I made a joke and I said, funny, that's not the only thing different about me, is it? You know, that I was the I. Because I didn't have to be dominant, yet I was in the same kind of position. But it was it was glaring. You know, and some people said, Oh my god, I would have figured you were a D. But, but it, that's interesting because, you know, we think again of leadership as dominance. And one of the things that we assert in the work that we do in our, in our company and when we go into a company is the first thing to recognize is that leadership is influence. Exactly. It's not dominance. It's influence. It's influence, right? And so I was the I, so I was happy that the I's have it. Yeah. And the D, but the thing that's fascinating is I know they were kind of sitting there thinking, huh, we're D's, you know, yeah, count my exactly. stuff. And, and so it is a huge challenge, and, and certainly in my career, I've been in technology and male-dominated industries my entire life, my entire life. When and you, I've sat at tables with, in a room with 60 men in leadership, and I'm the only woman. Right. But I'm not, not going to be the man, you know, in, the, the woman in, in, sheep, in men's clothing. That's just not who I am. And I want more and more women. And I speak, I do speak to women's organizations and I mentor young women. And I'd say, it's your voice. Companies need to get smarter and they're starting to, but it's lip service in many ways. Yes. Oh, we're going to pay them a little more. Okay, whatever. It's how are you treating them? And are you asking what they think and actually valuing what it is that they say? And, you know, it is, it's certainly, it's a tough, it's a tough road and, I just don't know how fast it will keep changing, but the more we talk about it and empower, it's all about empowering each other, um, empowering women and men, empowering men to be thoughtful Absolutely. and not, and not just, we're not, one of the chapters in my book is called be the change. We can't always look to others to change. We have to change yeah. first. Like, as and you said, you know, the, the, the idea of leadership has been dominance, but the truth of leadership is actually influence. And, and you know, for me, when I look at my two greatest, in, the people who impacted me the greatest in my own leadership and in my own path, those two people are Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and Gandhi, mm -hmm. who I never would conceive of as dominant, but definitely conceive of as high influences. These yes. are people who, who were committed to impacting the world and impacting certainly their world, but impacting the world, but without dominating over because both of them were driven by peaceful change, by, 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 by peaceful revolution, vastly different than let's just take the tanks in there. So it's, it's a completely different mindset. That, you know, and I just want to see if there's a connection here, but that piece around you know, you entered into the corporate world, you, mm -hmm. and you did very well in that world. Um, but that driver, you know, you talk about in your book, you talk about this in, inside you, this desire to be perfect, mm -hmm. and this striving for perfection. Do you do you see that part of that as being part of that? If you if you're going to be a woman in a quote unquote just hate saying it, but in the quote unquote the men's world, do you do you feel like for women there was there's an an impetus, uh, uh, a, a seed that says you got to be more perfect? Yeah, it's or kind of like, like nepotism. You know, yeah. like if you're the president's daughter or president's son, you've got to work that much harder because there's that connection. So as a woman, it's that you've got to overcome. So in many cases. There's that delta that says, okay, typically this would be a man's role. So since I'm a woman, I have to overcompensate right. for that, right? And so why do you always hear about people calling that so many women leaders, she's a bitch? Well, because she's probably being unnatural and inauthentic. Right. She's probably acting a way she thinks she's supposed to, to be in that role. Right. And, you know, my whole, you know, whole value system is show up as who you are. And you show up the same whether you're walking in the door to your family or you're walking in the door at work or you're meeting for dinner with your friends. Be who you are. Don't change yeah, who you that's, are. That, because that's then, a massive concept. I mean, I, I speak a lot about here. this. That, that I think that we get so stuck in this idea. I mean, it's, it's old conditioning again, but that there's a professional self and there's a personal self. And my response to that is bullshit. Yeah. There's okay. you. 
and there's you. And, yeah. and, and there's either the real you and the fake you or there's yeah. you. Those are the only options. So when if you say I have a professional self and I have a public self and I go, which one is you? Right. Because yeah. one of I just fake. have a self. It's just myself. Right. It's, and, and, and as soon as I realize that, my, my energy completely shifted. And then the people that I end up surrounding myself with are people like you. people, And then business colleagues that you never really touched on any of those things because I start talking. They say, oh, my gosh, Thank I think you. the same way. Yeah. I've, as I told you, I've had 29 different amazing meetings this week, all with different people and different different executives from companies and all that. And we ended up having, I had the same conversation with almost every single person. And that was all about being human right. and being authentic. Whether you're talking to a customer, whether you're talking to an employee, whether you're partnering with one another. At the end of the day, it's about showing up and being a human being, not being some, you know, I'm the president or I'm the vice president. Who gives a crap? So it's who brought, are you? What brought you to that point of realizing that you were running this perfect nonsense and that you had to change it? What, what, would, what brought you to that place of going, even the realization that you were driven to be perfect? Uh, you know, you said your mom sort of put that pressure yeah. on you, but, but what made you realize it? Because it's one thing to get this, this the, the, the parental or social or familial conditioning, but I think that yeah. most people generally speaking, are pretty blind to that until a certain point. What what awakened that within you? Yeah, well, so first of all, I mean, I think I, perfect is such an interesting word, people, because a lot of people, it's like a badge of honor. Well, she's perfect. Like, it's right. a good thing. I'm like, right. uh-uh. And I kind of knew, but then, again, I what really nailed it for me was when I read the book by Brene Brown, The Gifts of Imperfection. Yes. And that being imperfect is a gift. And as soon as I stopped kidding myself and thinking that I had to be perfect, I opened my eyes to so many different opportunities that I was blinded by because I was so worried about showing up a certain way. And that that book really was instrumental. It came pretty late in life, unfortunately, but I it still got there, which is great because it's also helped me change the way that I parent. And a lot of I've done, I just basically have become a student of my soul and of who I am. And, you know, I don't even like using the word self-discovery because it's got such bad taboo, but really a student of me and of my soul and how I interact, you know, with the world. And that's why showing up that I, I, I said this to someone earlier today, that if you ask 50 people in different aspects of my life to describe me, mm -hmm. They would all, within a slight degree of variation, would describe me in the same way. <coughs> when you when you think about who you were before you realized the power and, and the need for your vulnerability, how would you have described yourself before? Um, I would have said perfectionist is how I would have described myself. Um, Aloof, busy, yeah. distracted, um, kind. I think people would have said that I was kind. And I, you know, so those things didn't change. But that I was um, always, always moving, always on the go. And how would you describe yourself now? Um, present. Mm -hmm. um, vulnerable. Spiritual, right, and uh, really, you know, someone who's focusing on the other. I think I was very much more self-absorbed and self-involved about getting ahead. And I found in my relationships, both business and personal, um, that the more I give, mm -hmm. the more I get back. As opposed to always, so many times we go into engagements. Whether you're going to your, your, your people, your customers, your family, and we're going in to get something out of it. What are you going to get out of it? Right. Instead of give to get. Right. That I'm going to just give because I want to give. I'm not asking for anything. And then the, the miracles part about my book. And then all of these miracles happen that I wasn't asking for. Right. But it's because I gave first. 
And so I think as leaders, that's what we want to think about. What can I give to this organization? What can I give to make something better for my customer? Instead of worrying about, am I going to get this deal? Am I going to get this promotion? Are they going to give me this? Are they going to give me that? Well, what am I getting? Mm-hmm. And so that, again, goes back to that chapter that I talk about in my book, which is be the change. Right. That I've got to build. I've got to build me. And I've got to stand for something. That's another chapter in my book. Stand for something. Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. What do you do? Not be defined by the right. job that you do. I was hanging on, like you talked about in the beginning, hanging on to a corporate job because that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's what's expected in this world that we live in. And when you don't, people don't know how to handle you. When you described the way you were, I'm going to guess here, I'm assuming that you are (coughs) looking back and saying, yeah, that's who I was. But do you think you had any awareness of that's how you were? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh really? I did, and I didn't. But I didn't necessarily <coughs> think it was a bad thing, <laughs> mm. or or even know what to do. I thought I just need to keep being perfect, and then I'll be successful. If I just continue with this path of perfection, I'll be successful. The more I do, the more I'll get, and just down that path. As opposed to, I was focusing so much of my attention while I was. I think self-absorbed, but it was out there. What am I going to get instead of what am I doing, you know, for my own, for my own development? I, I, you know, because my experience is that a lot of people with hindsight can see these things, but rarely are they willing or able to see the veil while they're wearing the veil. You know what I mean? I, I think I could see it, but I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't necessarily think it was such a bad thing. Oh. I kind of thought if people, you know, would ask you to describe yourself, I'm like, yeah, I'm a perfectionist, but I kind of thought it was a good thing. It was like That's a badge of honor. It was a badge of honor, just like today, busy is a badge of honor for people. Mm-hmm. When people ask, how are you? They say, I'm just so busy. I don't ever say that anymore. And if I do, it's an accident. I, when someone says, how am I? I say, fabulous. I don't say I'm busy because guess what? That's table stakes today. Yeah. When, I, when someone doesn't call me back, they say, I'm sorry, I, was, I got really busy. What? And I'm not busy because you think I'm sitting around on my hands waiting for your phone call? I'm busy too. <laughs> but it's, it's the decent, respectful thing to do is to email me back within 24 hours if I've asked for something. Or because I do that for you. It's the right thing to do. And so this busy really bugs me is because it's, it is like perfect, this badge of honor. It isn't a badge of honor. I'd rather say, you know what? I'm free as a bird. You want to get together? People are like, oh, you're not working hard enough. There's this thing that we have to always be with our hair on fire. Exactly. You're absolutely right. I don't right. want that. I don't want that. Let's go back to that to that turning point. You know, you talked about um, seeing the, the Brene Brown video. You know, one of the things that I speak a lot about actually from the platform as well is that those quote-unquote, aha moments, the the way I would describe what you described. Um, We we put a lot of emphasis on those. We put a lot of uh, gravity in those things. But in truth, they don't really have a lot of weight. And what I mean by that is that if I ask, you know, you and I go out and and ask 100 people, have you had an aha moment? 100 people will say yes about something, right? 100 out of 100 will say, yeah, they had one about something. Did it change your life? Now you look back. For most people, the answer is no. You know, it was like, woo, oh my God, I saw, I, I, I've seen the light, I feel the Lord, you know, whatever it is, right? It changed. I feel my a life. healing coming it's on. Changed, yeah, but yeah, I get it. It doesn't. It changed my life. But it yeah. doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't actually change their life. I changed my life. It was the catalyst for change. But that's what I'm asking about. That yeah. moment isn't the thing. What was the thing for you? Because yeah. I found that for most people, the the thing happens, and this is my experience, not the truth. Yeah. The thing happens, we swear, you know, on a stack of Bibles, it's going to change, I feel the light, everything's going to change. And then Monday comes, right? Yeah. And shit happens on Monday, that, you know, you get right. back in the roll, and, you know, now the aha moment is a bragging right. Oh, yeah, I, I spoke to Dove, I had insight, I spoke to Amy, and ooh, it lit my fire. Whatever it is, I watched Bray yeah. Brown. 
But now it's Monday and I got to meet the deadline. Yeah. What was it for you that made it go from that, that what we call okay, pivotal yeah. moment to yeah. making the choice to go, you know what? Yeah. I got to do it different. Yeah. So I had one more sort of aha, not only one, but one other very significant one. And that's when I went and heard um, a, a presentation by my, he's my coach, but um, he wasn't at the time, which is Chris Doris. And he's a mental toughness coach and he does public speaking. And I had a, the great good fortune to sit and listen to him talk for 90 minutes. And he talked about all the different things around our limiting beliefs of what, what we go in and we walk in the door with our limiting beliefs and did a bunch of really cool exercises and things like that. But the last one he talked about was when you walk out the store, I want you to go 24 hours without complaining and I want you guys to write back and tell me what happens mm -hmm. and really try to do it. I talk about this in my book. I leave this room, place. We're in Arizona. I fly back. I'm like, I'm going to do this thing 24 hours. I'm not going to complain. And I stuck to it. The things that happened to me in my 24 hours, that's where the magic came. Mm -hmm. That I stopped complaining. When I would hear other people complaining, I would tune them out. And I just stayed in this very positive place. I noticed a change in my children when I went in this positive space and then they started communicating things back to me. I started getting messages from people from 15 years ago in my life telling me how grateful they were that I was their boss 15 years ago and they never said thank you. It happened in that 24 hour period. Right. And so what it did was it made me believe that if I change the way that I think and the way that I slow down enough to see what's gonna happen, that all these really great things are going to come into my life. So pick yourself up, stop moping around and be sad for your plight of divorce and of this and of that and the other. Stop trying to be strong. Let's go. And so that's when I said, and then another chapter in my book, because each chapter is called, I call it a table of disciplines and it answers the question, how do I move forward? Right, right. And one of the other teachings that I've got over gotten over time is you talk about decide, declare, and do what it takes. So what I think you're talking about when you have that aha moment, it's not enough to have that moment. You decide then that I got to do something about this. And you know what? I'm going to tell some people because I don't hold myself accountable too well. So I'm going to tell some other people. And then, but it's up to me to do what it takes to change and to change my life. And then I have to be the change. So that's and the point. That's the thing that, that I want to, I want to come to because listening to the first part of what you said there, I think it's very easy to people go, Oh, another positive thinker, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, yeah. positive yeah. thinking, you know, no, everybody yeah. knows it doesn't yeah, really right. change anything. Hold on a second. I got to go to the bathroom and vomit. Yeah, exactly. Right? So this is more than positive thinking. So, Oh, yeah. On a day when things are a bit rough, because the truth is, I don't care how positive you are, shit I happens in your life. I tell right? people all the time, I have crappy days. Right. So when on a day like that for you, when it seems um, just really quite rough, um, what gets you up in the morning? What is it that sets your heart and soul on fire when you feel the, the truck has backed up and dumped 30 tons of shit on you? Yeah, yeah. It's a, I, I do make it sort of my intention that every morning I do wake up and I, I do make that decision that it's going to be a good day. Now, when then the shit pile shows up. As it will. As it will. Usually I take, in, in depending on how bad it is, I typically will say, in this first chapter in my book, which is cry. Because I'm like, I kind of don't know what to do, but it's really easy. I just need to kind of let go of that emotion. Right. That, instead of which was before as I pulled it all in, right? right? That was the strong me. So I let it go. And then, you know, I wallow, you know, I wallow too. You know, I also always tell people like, just because I say I'm a positive minded person doesn't mean I don't have bad days. And then, but the difference is I've shortened that window of wallowing. And then I make the decision. <laughs> what am I going to do? Right. And, and then I ask. And so, it's not that I don't have those spaces. I just don't let myself go there for a long time because it doesn't serve me. 
Because it, nothing good comes from being a whiny, complaining person because it doesn't change the situation. What will change the situation is action. And so I go there and, you know, I've had people laugh. They go, you're the woman on positivity. Why are you in a bad mood? I go, well, I'll give you the 10 reasons why I'm in a bad mood today, you know, and I'm going to just get through it. And I'm, but I'm going to be kind of quiet about it. And I'm going to try to just solve my, solve the problem instead of sit there and talk about it. That's the thing, right? You know, again, not positive thinking, but <laughs> not, you know, I think that in, in our minds, and I know this to be true, the mind works in polarity. And so in the mind is, uh, uh, you know, I'm either all positive or I'm a whiny yeah. person. And, and you know what? That, that There's a whole lot of options in between those two polarities. How about I can, I'm allowed to feel, which is what you're talking about, I'm allowed to feel whatever the hell it is. You know, I, I one of many of you watching don't know this, but I traveled the world uh, the first part of my journey was to travel the world and study with these great spiritual teachers. And I lived and studied with great spiritual teachers. And a particular one of those was Buddhist monks. And I lived with these Buddhist monks. And and, and I learned this amazing lesson and, from a Western Buddhist. Now, meaning this was a, a Buddhist monk who was actually originally British living in Asia, who <laughs> said to me, who said to me, Westerners do not understand Buddhism. And I said, well, you're a Westerner. And he yeah. said, we, we don't understand Buddhism. And he says, for instance, we talk about detachment. And we think that that means you don't feel things, that stuff comes up and you just, no, I, I'm above that. That's not right. Buddhism. And he said, if you want to see a Buddhist in action, when something bad happens, they weep. They feel yeah. every single piece of it so there's nothing to carry forward. That's detachment. It's not that I'm not going to feel it. It's that I'm going to feel it all so that I can move forward and not take it with me. And this is the yeah. lesson that, that I really think is important for people to get that you're saying. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I didn't even know that, what you just described. And the first chapter in my book is cry and the last one is move toward. Right. And then it's all the stuff in between. Right. And that's why, and it's funny because when I do hit times of uncertainty, like my dad um, is in a nursing facility and they dropped him the other day and he had to go to the emergency room. My immediate instinct was cry. It I was, you know, it was scary. It felt, and then, okay, great. I've, I've, I'm in that feeling, but then I need to act. Like, what are we going to do? What do we need to do? Who should we call? Is mom okay? And then, and then activate. And so it is, you feel it just because I'm, you know, I don't, my mom used to use the word Pollyanna. I don't mean to be Pollyanna and say everything no. has to be so happy, but there, there comes a time when you just then stop complaining about it. And you can choose. I think a lot of people choose to be victims because it's, they feel safe that they hide behind being a victim yeah. because if they don't, that means they actually have to do something about it Very and true. face the challenges, which is why a lot of us get paralyzed when, when we're in uncertainty, but my, you know, my belief and my experience has been take one step, open one eye, take one, put one foot off of the bed onto the floor and you've started to activate. So it's really about taking that action. And that's what I learned through this, all the things that I went through. And then, and I've just gone through just more uncertainty, but what I do is I say, okay, how do I make it more certain right. so that I don't have to be in that? But then uncertainty can also be opportunity. As I don't know what the future brings. I don't know if I'm going to be successful in my new business or not. But you know what? My People say, aren't you scared? And I say, yeah, I'm scared that I'm just not going to be able to do everything I want to do. Right. It's you know, all the way. It's all your perspective. And there are going to be bad, horrible days. As you said, you know, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Yeah. So, so when you look at, you know, you have, it's hard because there's chapters and there's a lot of pieces here. And of course, we're not going to cover everything in the time we have. But when you look at the the overall umbrella content of your of your book, how would you say it specifically adds value to a Fortune 500, for instance, executive, or for that matter? A very high level entrepreneur. What would you say was the the nugget, the the diamond yeah. that you would want them to yeah. take away? And I think we've touched on some of it, but sure. what I think you know, what I think it speaks to is 
We spend so much time asking ourselves, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I making, you know, all these right decisions and things? And so, you know, I, what I think that piece is, is about being authentic and, and, and going back to that piece of, of vulnerability. Show up who you are mm-hmm. and, and realize that, you know, that it's okay if, if, if you fail or if somebody else fails because that's where you find the greatest learning. Yeah. Renee Brown says, you know, messy is where the magic happens. When things get all stirred up and you have a pile of shit, you know what? Then you turn around and go, yeah, but look what we learned from it. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many cliches about learn from your mistakes and, you know, all those different things. But it's so true. And that, that failure is an option. And it's okay because you're going to learn it. So people say failure is not an option. Okay, well, I don't believe that. I believe that you that's where you learn. And so my recommendation to executives and leaders today is, Show up and be real because that's, that's what breeds loyalty. As you probably know through research, the number one reason people leave companies is because of their direct, their relationship with their direct leader manager. No doubt about so it. if you don't have empathy and if you're not a real human being, they're going to walk out that door regardless of what you pay them, regardless of what they think of the company. It's all about you. It rests on you. Yep. Yeah. There's you want people to stay because of how they feel about you. And so that's my, would say, the messaging in my book is about, you know, have empathy, be human, and, and it's okay to fail. And let people know. Show your vulnerability. I don't want to work for somebody that's stiff. No. Nope. I want them to be real. Be a human being. Yeah, and, humanity. And if, and if you're not, then then I'm just going to I'm just gonna go off on my own, which is what I've done. Well, humanity is such a missing piece in, in leadership today, and we see that all the time, and it's very sad. Listen, it has been great having you here today. I want to thank you for this great message, fantastic conversation, and I know that people got tons out of it. Would you please share where our viewers, our listeners can find out more about you, whether it's your coaching, your consulting, or your speaking, they want to bring you in? How can Absolutely. they Absolutely. Yes. So my, uh, my website, brand new website, had a great uh, guy design. My website is um, www, of course, Amy Slater, S-L-A-T-E-R, consulting.com. On there, there's also a link that takes you straight to my book. There's a link that will take you straight to my email. So would love to hear any feedback as well uh, on what you learned here today. That is great. And like you said, it's been a real pleasure having you. It's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but you're singing to the choir. <laughs> yes, yes, I know I am. Lots of, that's why we connected so well. Yeah, that's Thank so you so great. much. So I'm going to sign off and say goodbye to everybody else. I hope you'll stay with us till the end, and I'll come back to you when we're done. But I want to say thank you to you, and I want to say thank you to all of our viewers and all of our listeners. And as always, as I always say to you, please, I know podcasts to listen to in the background, but give it a second listen. I promise you, you missed a lot the first time. Take some notes. We learn far more when we take notes here by hand because it allows the left and right hemisphere to work together and bring you back and center you in the information that was shared with you. And Amy took the time out today to really share with you some real jewels that you really need to take in and and put in your own heart and in your own soul, because that's what's really important. And I want to, again, remind you that you can find out more about Amy at amyslaterconsulting.com. Of course, we will post that with the podcast. You'll be able to find it right there. But however, If you are truly serious about having the kind of laser beam clarity and focus that will cause a massive positive disruption and build a culture that develops the next generation of leaders, not only into who they want to be, but who they need to be, and create a 10x engagement, reach out to me. My name is Darv Barron. You'll find me at fullmontyleadership.com. Also, stop by The Matrix, which is matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and get my authentic leadership matrix is a self-assessment tool it's valued at 197 197 bucks you get it for free because it's in beta so again go to matrix.fullmontyleadership.com thank you for joining us here at leadership and loyalty tips for executives part of the full monty interview series again i'm your host Dave baron i want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody that you know and remember as always we need your help in staying relevant so get yourself over to itunes rate review and subscribe to the show come on over and subscribe to our youtube channel Dove Baron for Monty Leadership, and I publish new blogs, videos, articles every Tuesday and Thursday. So until next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious 
about how you can reveal just a little more of who you really are, because that is what will connect people to you. I'm Dove Baron, and I'm out.